Hallelujah. And if you have a Bible with you, and hopefully you have because you're at a Bible study, turn with me to Zechariah and chapter 4. Chapter 4. So we've had, I think it's been about a five-week gap. Feels longer. Feels longer. There's only been that. But we can get out of the habit of these things very easily. It's just been the month of August that we have. We're now back after our Bible reading week, ready to kind of go again. And we're going to carry on with our Minor Prophet course. There's 10 more chapters after this in Zechariah. Then there's four chapters in Malachi. And then it'll be Christmas. So just so you know, it's 15 weeks till Christmas. Oh, well, there you go. You haven't been buying your Christmas presents yet. You need to start getting on with it. But it's important that we know. Now, tonight there's going to be lots of reading, but I'm going to do a reasonably good-sized recap so that we can catch up from that five-week gap and kind of remember who's Zachariah and why is he speaking at all. So let's start with chapter four and let's read around together. And don't forget to use the microphones for the benefit of those who are listening on the audio on YouTube or if they've had a CD downloaded so that they know that the 250 of us in here that have gathered for this Bible study are utterly blessed. Amen. Zechariah 4.1 says, Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me. There's a man who's wakened out of his sleep. He said to me, What do you see? So I said, I'm looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on the top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps, with seven pipes to seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and one at the left of the bowl. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked to me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Verse 6. So he answered... So he answered. You're on. You're on, Doc. Don't worry. (laughs) So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountains? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become plain, and he shall bring forth a capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. The hands of Zerubbabel. They have laid foundations in this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For, uh, for who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip uh, with receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, Do you know what these are? And I said, No, my lord. So he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Amen. Amen. So, as always, another prophetic image that seems the craziest thing that you could possibly think of. Two trees and a candlestick in the middle of them. And the trees are pouring oil into the candlestick. What could it all mean? Well, let's understand, first of all, where we are. So one of the things we know straight away about Zechariah, we learn it from Ezra 5.1, is that he prophesied at the same time as Haggai. Haggai, the prophet that's before him in the Minor Prophets, and he prophesied for exactly the same reason. His job, like Haggai's job, was to encourage the people to build the temple. Very important job, very specific, and then he needed to do it. Now, what we learned in Haggai is that these people who've come back from the exile, they're called, quite surprisingly, the post-exilic people. So the post-exilic people was that now they were very much different to the guys who were before. The ones who were before to all the other minor prophets, and most of the other prophets, the majors also prophesied to, 
They were very sure of themselves in many respects, but they had a few things that these group didn't. This group didn't have a temple. They didn't even have a tabernacle. So Mosaic Judaism is impossible without a temple. You need a temple for the sacrificial system. Jeremiah had told them as they'd been carried to Babylon that they needed to build houses, set up businesses, carry on with life. But they still must remain separate. Keep themselves separate from the other nations. That doesn't mean don't interact with the other nations. That means don't intermarry with the other nations. Yet, as I uh, remembered from reading in the, the Bible reading week when we were reading, if you read any of Ezra and if you read any of Nehemiah, of course they didn't do very well at that, they kept themselves mostly separate, but there was quite a lot of intermarrying going on. They were supposed to stay separate and wait on the promised restoration that the prophets that we've already studied now have promised was coming. A kingdom that was to come. And something that Daniel had really made secure. But when that proclamation came that they were told to wait for, when the promise came from King Cyrus to go back to the nation, that they can now go back to the place that Judea was, they can go back, they can rebuild the city, they can rebuild the temple, only 10% of the nation went back. The other 90% remained. And of that 10% that went back, which, by the way, was what the prophet said would happen. It would only ever be a remnant. They don't speak Hebrew anymore. So the language of the scriptures is gone for them. It has to be translated to them. That's where the idea of scribes come from, that later become this great group that are always at loggerheads with Jesus because they think themselves the protection of the law. So they can't speak Hebrew They've never experienced the temple sacrifices in their life because the temple has been destroyed their entire existence. They don't even really know what Judea looks like because they've not been there. They've lived, well, where Iran is today. But their desire for a king is also gone. There's no desire to put a son of David on the throne. It's not that they don't want to be a kingdom. They don't have republican ideas. They don't want to become a Greek democracy. They've changed their mind, just like Samuel said that they would. When they said to Samuel, we want a king, Samuel said all the bad things that he would do, and in the end he would cause your destruction, and having caused their destruction, and having done all the very bad things that he said they were doing, they were prepared to have only one king now. God. They were prepared to accept that the Lord should reign. And that's wonderful. So they'd return to rebuild the temple under the governorship of Zerubbabel. But those who were round about were not happy. The Samaritans, as they were, and all the other nations they started, they didn't like the idea of a return once again to Jerusalem. Do you know what's important about Jerusalem? Strategically. It is on a hill, but it's on a hill nowhere. There's nothing there. There's no great resource. There's no great river. There's a hill that makes it a really good defensible point, but it doesn't go, and it's not on the road to anywhere. And yet it's the most contentious city on the earth and has been since its existence. And there's nothing at all that is physically important about it. And yet people, even today, even today in our country, people hold rallies against the very idea that Israel would call Jerusalem their capital city. It's amazing that when you think about that as a place, and so their enemies did not like the idea of the return of this place. It being in rubble was what they wanted. It being a place that was full of those who were survivor mentality with their sleeves, well, still firmly rolled down and their hands quite firmly sticking out instead of their sleeves rolled up and their hands ready to do the labor. So these returning, coming to build and coming to do this work, they were so angry about it that they began to write letters. They wrote letters to the king of Persia, Darius, 
and he reminded Darius of all the things that Israel had done when it had kings. All of its past, all of its sins, all of its mistakes, all of its rebellions. And Darius stopped the work. It demoralized them. In doing exactly what the Lord had told the Israelites to do, they faced opposition. To the point that they stopped doing what the Lord had commanded them to do. I wonder if you can connect to that, where you felt that opposition so much to the point that you've not wanted to do that thing that you know you were called to do. And that's what Haggai and Zechariah are here about. Because this is very firmly what they've been called to do. Haggai encouraged them on three different occasions to build the physical temple by showing them that in so doing, there would actually be physical results. One of them being the Son of God would walk in that temple. An amazing thing that all the other temples and the tabernacle had had the power of God pour down inside and consume the offering so great that nobody could remain. And that didn't happen to this temple. This one had the Son of God, the absolute God on earth, walk within it. And everybody could remain. And hear the words of life. So Haggai encouraged them to do that. And we might say, well, if Haggai did that, why did Zechariah need to prophesy as well? We got all that out of Haggai. Why do we need Zechariah? And the answer is really, is what Zechariah is here prophesying about. Now, Zechariah isn't the same length as Haggai. Zechariah isn't as simple to understand as Haggai. Zechariah is possibly one of the most complex books in the Bible. Its complexity is amazing, and it makes us struggle. And that's why we see, like today, a candlestick with two trees beside it, and we're thinking, is that really going to be our first Bible study back in the new year? And it's fine, because next week we get onto a flying scroll and a woman in a basket. <laughs> with a lead weight on her head. And people with wings flying her about. Because that all seems very normal. And those people who kind of talk about prophecy in a literal sense, you show them that and they go, apart from that one. But there's an understand that we have to get out of here. You see, he's here to encourage the remnant to return, just like Haggai, by showing them the reason that they need to come, which is the future kingdom. But unlike Haggai, his message is not about the physical, it's about the spiritual. And the reason that Zechariah is so complex is because when we're dealing with the spiritual realm, we're dealing with things that are outside of our understanding. They're outside of our way of understanding the world. We're tangible, we touch things, we understand linear. We understand that the last five minutes of your life, you're not getting back. You understand all of these things. That's the principle you live in. In fact, to try and not live in that, it messes with your head. That's why you never watch a film that's about time traveling. You just go, ooh, I don't understand. I'm lost. Let's just enjoy the plot. The reason, because it is a realm beyond our understanding. So what the Lord does is he takes something that's completely beyond our understanding and anthropomorphizes it. In other words, he gives it a human face. He puts it in a way that humans can understand it. To an extent, when we understand what these things mean and why they are next together. Because, of course... A candle with two trees by the side of it doesn't really mean anything to anybody here other than possibly you're on holiday. But there is more to it. And that is far more complex when we think about it in the spiritual. So in the human, it's been put into a way that we can understand it. And that's why we have to develop it and understand it more. But it is open for us because, like most prophecy, it distinguishes how spiritual interacts with physical. The spiritual world and the physical world are not separate. The physical world and the spiritual world interact all of the time. And you know that that's true because you experience it in your own lives. Because you hear that phrase, I feel like I'm under attack. I feel like that. And it can have that physical sense and place in your life it has a physical 
But when we understand prophecy, where the spiritual interacts with the physical, we cannot see this as how the events will literally happen, but it's still prophecy about literal events, things that will happen. And along with all that, in this chapters, up to the end of chapter 6. So everything we've already studied, the first three chapters, and these next three chapters, they're all just one prophecy. Given in one case, but with lots of different things. Put simply, everything the Lord... Sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. This is all one prophecy. So in the first chapter... The Lord delivers to Zechariah what we might call an important hanging nail message in the first six verses. And put it simply, everything the Lord has said to the forefathers of the Jews through the prophets happened. So if it happened, then you must not ignore the words that are coming out of Zechariah. And you might wonder... Why is it that the Lord feels that that's the first thing that should be said by Zechariah? Why wasn't it said by all the other prophets? But why is it the first thing that Zechariah needed to say? Why was it important that they knew that about Zechariah and Haggai? And the answer is, what the Lord is about to reveal will be beyond belief. Because where is Israel now? It's not the mighty nation of Solomon. It's not even a vassal nation. It's just a few thousand of a large nation who have returned to build a temple. And Haggai and Zechariah are talking about coming kingdoms and dominion over all the world and the power of God emanating and a kingdom that will be run by a son of David, by the Lord God Almighty. And that just sounds ridiculous when even the other 90% of our own nation didn't want to come along with us. So how can you tell me that the whole world is going to come through this situation? And so because all the rest came true, you better believe that this is too. So the first chapter of Zechariah shows a message to those who are oppressed. Those who are actually coming under oppression by authorities. Oppression from things that are around about. And that's the children of Israel here. They have been sent letters by Darius and Darius's official telling them that they will be killed if they start on with this work. And by Sanballat and Tobiah and all of these other men who are the just the local rulers who are also coming against them. They have all of these things. And the Lord says to them through Zechariah, don't pray for fire to come down on them. Don't pray for the Lord to pour his judgment out on them quickly. That's not the kind of God I am. Instead, understand that with all of these physical things that are going on, there's a spiritual work that's happening, that's happening because of this temple. That spiritual work and what will be accomplished because of what you've written is four craftsmen, four gospel writers will take these horns that were meant to destroy these Gentiles and they will beat them and craft them into something completely new. The gospel of grace. The spiritual work that has been accomplished by their labors is a work to change the nations into that which the Lord has made able. And it will let them go from not being his people, being his enemies, to becoming his people. So don't call for fire to come down on your enemies because there's an opportunity that they may come to be your brothers and sisters. It's a hard lesson to learn. It's a hard lesson to accept. And we're happy to tell other people that. <laughs> but it's important that we acknowledge it for ourselves. Zechariah was telling the restoration would not be Israel alone. And as we know at the time of Jesus, the Jews didn't want to hear that message. 
Even after that, when the church began, we get to Acts 15, the Pharisees who have accepted Christ Jesus as Savior still don't want to hear that message. And James stands up and shows them that the Old Testament made it abundantly clear that God was going to call the people who were not his people to be his people. But they still didn't want him to be. They wanted it to be just their party. And they didn't want anybody else to be a part of it. And so the Lord challenged them immediately. The building the temple is not at odds with the gospel. It's actually the purpose of it. But then having dealt with the external opposition in chapter 2, the Lord now reveals that there's even internal opposition. There's people who have actually made the journey. They are part of the 10%. And they're the ones that are causing hassle from within. And he does it by showing the image of one who's got a measuring stick. He's measuring Jerusalem. And the message is to the man with the measuring stick to tell him that's a stupid thing to do. Physical cities have boundaries. They can't go on indefinitely. I mean, somebody could tell you, do telling our government that about London. But they can't go on indefinitely. There comes an end to the point that they can go. But... If we grab hold of the spiritual understanding and analogy of we as the bride of Christ, when shown to John in the book of Revelation, he sees the city of Jerusalem. The Lord isn't marrying more than one bride. Therefore, we are also considered to be the city of Jerusalem. That fits with so many of the things that are taught through Scripture, like Paul teaching that we are buildings of God, building on one another, that foundation being Christ Jesus. We already know that we're not the temple, but at the same time, we are the temple. The church is the city, and that city doesn't have a limit. You can't measure it. It doesn't have an edge. When John sees the people getting saved, he can't count the number. You can't go around with a stick and saying, this is as far as God can go, and God can't go any further. The problem is, is that we are limited. Even the most faithful person is limited to believe what God can do. Because God is beyond the measure of anybody's faith. Both directions. And nobody can limit what God can do, because God can make bread out of the very stones. And he could raise up for himself worshippers who are descendants of Abraham. So, because the Lord can do it, their job was a futile one. Who can measure the works of God? Who can limit his infinite grace? Who can say what the line of none shall perish will be drawn? Who can say how many the few who find it will be? No man can say it. You see, the man with the measuring stick is a man of his time. He's one who causes doubt from within. Whereas those in chapter 1 are those who cause doubt from out. What he does is he says, maybe we've got as far as we can. Maybe it's time for us to just accept that this is all we will be. We'll accept the limitations of what we are, and that's what we are. Israel had been stopped from working by the enemies of the will of God. It was not the will of God that they stopped with half a temple built. And some of the doubters of Zechariah was identifying with those who said, maybe we've got as far as we can. And this is what we have to understand. When we hit resistance, that doesn't mean that's the end of it. We can't hit resistance and say, oh, God must have left me. Maybe I'm not supposed to be doing it anymore. That's crazy, and it's futile. We cannot measure where the kingdom of heaven will extend to because of our present circumstances. We have to be beyond that because the Lord is beyond that. And whether they be good or bad ones, why? Because it's not us who are building the kingdom. It's the Lord who is building the kingdom. And we are who he is using to build. Therefore, we have to start limiting the borders of what God can do. And what God will do. So that's the message. You can't limit the borders of that new Jerusalem. No man can count them for the walls are God's. Don't limit them. Now... Remembering that what the people at the time were building was a temple within a city that would, of course, have physical limits. But in the spiritual, the Jerusalem that they were building was not yet to come. 
We are that Jerusalem, the church. We are protected by the Lord. We are the apple of his eye. And so keep building. Don't be a doubter of the possibilities of God simply because of what you see. And then finally, chapter 3, which should catch us back up where we are, shows us that if you allow opposition to stop you just like the Jews had, and it had stopped them for 15 years, then you lose purpose. And when you lose purpose, you can't work anymore. We see an image of Satan accusing, condemning the high priest because his garments are filthy. It's a true image of what goes on in the spiritual realm all the time. Except for in chapter 3, we hear the Lord say these things. I rebuke you, Satan. No, I rebuke you because I paid in full. I rebuke you because he's done this. I rebuke you because of that. I rebuke you, Satan. I rebuke you. Your accusation may be correct. He may very well have filthy clothes on, but I rebuke you. And that's not a reason. That's the kind of answer I get off my kids. It's a response, and it's the Lord's response to the devil whenever he stands in judgment to any one of us. I rebuke you. In all of your life, there's a battle raging in the heavenlies. Don't seek peace in your circumstances. And don't think that shalom peace means a peaceful time with the Lord either. It means peace despite what's going on. And there is always victory in Christ. It means that despite your battles and trials in the physical, the spiritual consequences is that what you do really does matter. Because the Lord is the one who fights for you. And the Lord doesn't fight pointless battles. So if he's fighting for you, and the scripture says he is, you're not a pointless battle. So, we've caught up. That's the end of the Bible studies now. What does chapter 4 add to us? Well, there's a lot for us to get out of this and a lot for us to read, so I hope that you're all ready for that. There comes a point in your Christian walk where you hit a roadblock and you can't go any further. You strive really hard. You do everything that you think is right. You do everything that you feel that the Lord has told you to do. You're obedient all the way. And no matter what you try, you keep getting stopped and you keep getting thwarted. It's not the same as giving up. I'm not talking about giving up. I'm not saying you're saying you can't do it. This is when you keep pushing, but the wall doesn't give. In their occasion, the children of Israel had hit such a barrier. They may have been motivated now by Haggai and then by Zechariah. They may have been in a ready state to go, but the wall was still locked. They were still bound by the empire of that world, who had made a legal plea that they could not. And what we've already understood and what we already know from Zechariah and what I've just caught you up is behind physical barriers, there's always a spiritual barrier. Now that's not a revelation probably to most of you. We all know that we fight against principalities and powers. But how do you fight against such things? We pray. We fast, we seek, but I wonder if you're honest with yourself in a real reality. When you hear that message of Zechariah 3, that the Lord has chosen Jerusalem, you ask yourself, well, if we're the apple of your eye, God, if you've chosen us, if the thing we're building is what you want us to build, I mean, quite frankly, it's not what we want to build. We want to build a condo out in Lanzarote, but... 
if this is the thing that you want us to build, and we're doing the thing that you've told us to do, and we're being obedient to all of those things, why are you letting this enemy block? Why can't I push through this? Why can't I get past this? Why are you allowing this blockage, Lord? It doesn't make any sense. I'm doing what you want me to do. Why don't you just clear it out? Like you cleared the Red Sea. You parted it right there and then. Here it goes, an immovable area, but it's gone. It's gone in two, and we can walk right across it. Why not do the same thing? And the Jordan, the Lord did exactly the same so that we can just pass through. And you know what? I don't think that's often an unfair question. I've got to say there are many times I sit there with the Lord and I go, I I can't believe this is how you want it. Surely this isn't how you want it. And you know, at times it can rock our faith. And really rock our faith. Now to that question, we're given the image here of Zechariah 4. And we're told exactly what its meaning is in verses 6 to 7. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become a plain, and he will bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Overcoming. Verse 7 refers to this great mountain. And it describes this mountain as Zerubbabel's adversary. The thing that is causing the blockage. Now that might seem silly, because how can a mountain be an adversary? You only need to dodge to the left. I guarantee it won't follow you. They don't move. So wow. Of course, it's the attributes of a mountain that make a mountain a great adversary. So what are those, advers- those attributes? Well, mountains don't go and wage war on people. They don't have large armies that pour out on things. It's as simple as this. Mountains are hard to pass. Those people that like hiking and like hiking around mountains, you weird people. The harder the better, it seems. The higher the better. The more oxygen tanks you need, the better. The likelihood of death, the better. You don't get that on a walk around a park, do you? It's a slimmer chance of you needing oxygen and the possibility of you dying of hypothermia unless it's in a deep winter of doing that. Mountains become adversaries because they are impassable or they make passing them hard. They make bringing armies over hard. We all know about Hannibal trying to bring his elephants over the Alps. I mean... Trying to bring a family of four over the Alps is hard enough. So that in itself is, I mean, you've got all kinds of crazy mountains up there. Mount, elephant, and an army, and all of that. Napoleon trying to drag his army over the Pyrenees. The natural borders. That's why so many maps show lines that go through mountain ranges because they provide borders. And then by providing these natural borders, they don't move. You haven't got to worry about them getting up and going and not being there anymore. They're there. They don't move. So they are immovable, impassable boundaries. Now, doesn't that feel like a blockage in your life? Have you ever felt like there is an immovable, mountainous range right in front of you and the idea of climbing its peak and going right through it sounds scarier and you can't go through the mines? You can't go through the mines. So it's the attributes of the mountain. A mountain can be attributed of any foe in your life, any issue in your life. You can think about mountains that go on all the time. And we have to remember the words of Jesus when we think about mountains. Just turn with me to Matthew 21. And let's just read verses 18 to 22. Matthew 21, 18 to 22. One, two. Oh, yeah, on. In the morning, as Jesus was returning to Jerusalem, he was hungry. He noticed a fig tree beside the road. He went over to see if there were any figs. 
but there were only leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree withered up. The disciples were amazed when they saw this and asked, How did the fig tree wither so quickly? Then Jesus told them, I tell the truth, if you don't have faith and do not doubt, you can do things like this and much more. You can say to this mountain, You may, you can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. Now we know that. Jesus says this over the fig tree, curses it, of course, the fig tree representing the nation of Israel. This is in the Passion Week. This is the last thing, having been offering that way of salvation and the nation practically rejecting him. He shows that like that, the fruit that's not been found, the curse has come upon, but the instant there. And we, we know this phrase, if I had faith like a mustard seed, I could say to that mountain, be cast into the sea. And we think of all kinds of different things like that, but its correct context is in the terms of what I've just said to you. If those are removable pro objects, if you have those situations, those mountain adversaries in your life, if you had faith, then God would move them and throw them into the sea. Sometimes we just don't realize what mountains are in our lives, and we are ending up screaming at small mounds instead of immovable mountains. But in this prophecy, we see mountains refer to kingdoms. We have to look at a few scriptures so that I can prove that that is true to you. And it's not just my words. So very quickly, can we turn to Jeremiah 51? And can we just read verses 24 to 25? Jeremiah 51, 24 to 25. If it helps, it's near Lamentations. I will repay Babylon and the people of Babylonia for all the wrong they have done to my people in Jerusalem, says the Lord. Look, almighty mountain, destroyer of the earth. I am your enemy, says the Lord. I will raise my fist against you to knock you down from the heights. When I am finished, you'll be nothing but a heap of burnt rubble. There we go. Now that's an important understanding here because there are mountains in our lives that maybe they're not mountains. There are things that get in our way, but if we talk about the grand scheme of Scripture, we've all got our mountain that is in our way, the mountain, the great wicked mountain. And the reference here, it's seen throughout Scripture. This one mountain is the mountain that stands against the works of God, and we as the saints of God stands against us. And why is it called an mountain? Because we've understood it. it's an immovable, impassable mountain. It doesn't want you to get through to what is on the other side. Its object is to stop you getting there and to make everything far more difficult than it needs to be. I feel I've said that so many times in the darkness. Why is this so hard? Why is this harder than it needs to be? It's... Ah! Because there is somebody out there who wants it. But what we see here, the first mention, of course, the reference is to the kingdom of Babylon. Now, the ancient kingdom of Babylon is gone. But the understanding of the spiritual idea of the kingdom of Babylon as being a seat of the enemy's work, the religion of Babylon passes through, and we still see it today. We see it on the side of ambulances. And uh, in many other different things, actually, you'd be quite surprised what you see. Many of these old, ancient Babylonian gods still around today, worshipped in their sense, seen as important in their sense of all of the things that they do. So we see this, this, and it links us to something, the great mountain. Now just slick with me to Revelation chapter 8. And let's read verses 8 and 9. Let's see what the end of that mountain is. Revelation 8, 8 to 9.
The second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. So we know that that mountain is the mountain that has already been read out because it's a mountain that's now been set on fire. And what happens to it is, is it's cast down and it will be cast out and it will be cast away. This great mountain, the spiritual kingdom of Babylon, will be the one that needs cast down in the end. Why does it need to be cast down? Because Zerubbabel is going to put the capstone on. Now, if you're wondering what a capstone is, it's the last stone that goes on something. Zerubbabel is going to finish the job that he started. And you're thinking, Zerubbabel, isn't he dead? Yes. But Zerubbabel was a son of David. And a son of David will finish the job. And that will be Christ Jesus. So the mountain needs casting down so that the job can be done. So we have a barrier in our way. That barrier is the great mountain. And the promise that we're getting here is that that thing will be cast down. But what we need to first of all look at is Babylon is a kingdom. We see that the Lord then revealed that Babylon as a kingdom has many faces. So that we understand that this has far more meaning than just an end of the world one. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. It wasn't like Martin Luther King's. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a statue. Let's just have a look at that statue. Because he was seeing what that kingdom would look like. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. And let's read verses 31 to 45. Daniel 2, 31 to 45. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. To 45. Oh, sorry. After you, another kingdom will rise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock 
cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. Very good. Here we see in Daniel, there are two kingdoms. There are only two kingdoms. One of them splits into many different kingdoms, one falling after the other after the other, but that is one kingdom. It's the kingdom of the mountain. It's the kingdom of Babylon. And in that kingdom, we read these strange words, God's given dominion and authority of all mankind and of all the animals and all the beasts. Everything is under this godless kingdom. And that authority passes through each one. But the other kingdom that will come and destroy that is the kingdom of heaven. And it is the kingdom of heaven which destroys the kingdom of Babylon. They are all different, those kingdoms, but they have the same quality. And their end kingdom, the one with the ten toes, is described in another one of Daniel's dreams. So just turn with me to Daniel 7, and let's read verses 1 to 11. It's important that we understand this mountain, this kingdom, and its nature, before we understand the rest of it. Daniel 7, 1 to 11. Earlier during the first year of King Belshazzar's reign in Babylon, Daniel had a dream and saw visions as he lay in his bed. He wrote down the dream, and this is what he saw. In my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw a great storm (coughs) during the surface of the great sea, with strong winds blowing from every direction. The four huge beasts came up out of the water, each different from the others. The first beast was like a lion with eagle's wings. As I watched, its wings were pulled off, and it was left standing with its two hind feet on the ground like a human being, and it was given a human mind. Then I saw the second beast, and it looked like a burr. It was rearing up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and I heard a voice saying to it, Get up and devour the flesh of many people. Then the third of these strange beasts appeared, and it looked like a leopard. It had four, four bird's wings on its back and four heads. Great authority was given to this beast. Is it to verse 9? 11. Then I saw... Then in my vision that night, I saw a fourth beast, terrifying, dreadful, and very strong. It devoured, the, devoured and crushed its victims with the huge iron teeth and trampled their remains beneath its feet. This was different from the other, all the other beasts. It had ten horns. As I was looking, the horns suddenly... The, as I was looking, <coughs> the horns, suddenly another small horn appeared among them. Three of the first horns were torn out by its roots to make room for it. The little horn had, had eyes, like human eyes, and a mouth was, was boast, which that was boasting arrogantly. I watched the thrones as they were put in place and the ancient one sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow. His hair was pure as wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. Then the court began its session and the books were opened. I continued to watch because I could hear the little horn's boastful speech. I kept watching until the fourth beast was killed and its body was destroyed by fire. Thank you very much. Now, why do you need to know that? That's a complex scripture, and we're not going to look at all the complexities in there, but the same as Nebuchadnezzar's vision of a statue which saw all these kingdoms that would follow after Babylon, but they're all still the same statue. We see all these beasts, and the last beast is still a part of all of it, and it takes us right up to the judgment that those nations still exist, but it is God that will come down. And from those will one man come, this little horn, and exalt himself as the Messiah and the ruler over all things. We see a counterfeit. And that will take us on to what we see with the woman in the basket and the flying scroll. And you'll be going, oh, really? Are we going to find that all in that? And the answer is, yes, you will. It is the complex understanding of Scripture, but we need to know there's a mountain in our way. What is it that keeps stopping us, thwarting us, meaning that we can't get on with the things? It's the great mountain. And understand, thank you very much, that that great mountain is also on its way out. But then to understand that that great mountain exists in different faces, different kingdoms, 
that represent that kingdom. And that means that throughout our lives, and throughout the lives of all Scripture and the people who have lived in that time, there have been the Babylonians, then the Medes and the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans, who have been blockages and persecutors of the saints of Jesus Christ. Why do you need to know all that? Because we need to know what this kingdom is amounting, which blocks the way about. So let's flick back to Revelation. And let's turn to Revelation chapter 13, and let's read verses 1 to 9. And if you can, stay in Revelation 13 for me. Revelation 13, 1 to 9. And he stood on the sand of the seashore. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? And there was given to him a mouth, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. And authority to act for forty-two months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. If anyone has a hear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is a perseverance in the faith of the saints. Thank you very much. Now it's important just so that we don't lose ourselves, what we're talking about here is, we're not talking about some fantastical, mythical beast. And nor are we talking about our ruler of a kingdom. This is a kingdom. So the image is given this image of a ten-headed beast that climbs out of the sea. And if you notice, what's that a fourth kingdom made up of? Well, it's got leopard and bear and lion. So it's got the other three kingdoms in its makeup, in its midst. It is a kingdom. We live in a kingdom. We live in the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom is made up of four separate nations. Five of Cornwall gets its way. And in those four nations, there are different seats of government with various devolved powers. In other countries, there are places where those nations make up and they have their own seats of government and their own rules. You take the United States, a different way of saying the United Kingdom, the United States is 50 states, all who have their own state governor, have their own state police force, have their own state guard, have their own state laws. They are 50 separate countries. That all come together and make one kingdom. Except for they don't have a king yet. We'll give him his chance. They, don't <laughs> they have a president. But they are that. And so we understand that it's a kingdom that's made up of probably all the nations of the world. That are all coming together because it climbs out of the sea, meaning the nations. But it's a persecutor, it's a blocker. And the bit that's hard to hear in that scripture is that he is given authority to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Who gives him that authority? God gives him that authority. In other words, he has been given the authority by the Lord to be that barrier that I mentioned right at the start. That immovable, why is everything so hard, Lord, when I'm doing it the way that you wanted me to do it, going exactly where you want me to do? Why have I got this immovable barrier in front of me that I can't get past? What do you mean you put it there? 
like a wall I'm not allowed to knock out. What do you mean you put it there? What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that not only does the Lord not move the blockage, it's he who allowed it to happen. But why? Well, have a look at verses 8 to 10 of Revelation 13. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has a hear, an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone who kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. What's the reason? Because it brings out trial as we read in other scriptures, brings out what is within. What does it bring out? It reveals to us. It brings forth. And it will be each of these kingdoms in their turn that will make war on the saints. What does it bring out? It reveals to us who the tares are. It reveals to us who the tares are in that situation. It reveals to us who the doubters. What has happened in Zechariah with the closing? They've discovered who the enemy is within, and they have discovered who the enemy is without. It's funny how often a trial situation reveals to you friend and foe. Sometimes the foe is not the foe you thought it was. Sometimes the friend is not the friends you thought they were. It reveals them. Now, at the time that Zechariah is prophesying, the kingdom is the Persian kingdom, the bear. And that has stopped the work of building the house. And even though all of this may be surprisingly and flabbergastingly true to you today to find that you're doing what God said, you've hit a wall and God put the wall there, What we learn in this vision of Zechariah is that Zerubbabel, as a descendant of King David, will finish the job. In other words, there may be an immovable mountain in front of you, but faith as small as a mustard seed will say to that mountain, be thrown into the sea. Or you can get rid of all those little mountains in your life, but it's the big one we want out of the way. It's the big one we want out of the way. That's what the Lord says to us. And the Lord has said it so. He says it in verses 8 to 10 of Zechariah uh, 4. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, The hands of Zerubbabel has laid the foundation of this temple. His hand will also finish it. And then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? Friends. Since God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent, has he said it, and will he not do it? The word of God cannot be broken. The Lord has made a promise. It is yes and amen. So cast iron promises. But Lord, why the delay now? Have we all really got to wait till the end? We've got to go as far as we can and then hit the mountain and just keep kind of chipping away at that mountain. And what we often console ourselves with the phrase is, well, it'll all be in the Lord's timing. (laughs) We love it when other people say it to us. (laughs) And it's true. It will be in the Lord's timing. But it's never a consolation. I don't care who you are. It never works. Well, it'll happen when it's the Lord's timing. (laughs) <laughs> what am I doing between now and then then it doesn't if we're honest of ourselves we rarely take it as a consolation the idea of waiting itself is a pain in the neck Zachariah's word of encouragement however is not merely some triumphal declaration to say don't worry about all the hardship you're having now one day it will get better 
And if not, at least you're going to heaven. And that'll be good. It's much more than that. It's more important, in fact, that we understand what he is saying here because it's more than a triumphalism. Many Christians make these statements to try and G themselves up or even try and seem spiritual, even motivate groups of people. But it was, in fact, a comprehensive understanding of how the work will be completed that we will be encouraged. When Zerubbabel caps... What it says here at the end of chapter 10, uh, sorry, verse 10 is, I'm sorry, verse 7, grace, grace to it. The word for grace in Hebrew is shen. That word means unmerited favor or kindness. In the New Testament, in Greek, we know that the word for grace, or you may not know this, but if you ever know anybody with this name, now you know why they're called, is charis. And it means exactly the same thing. So if you know anybody called charis, you go, why don't your parents just call you grace? Charis, unmerited favor and kindness. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us when you get to the goal, through the blockage and to the end, you'll be in no doubt whatsoever how it happened. Not by might. Not by power. But by my spirit, says the Lord. Because can you remember, what does Genesis 3.15 and 16 tell us is actually God's plan? It's not to de defeat sin. That's a byproduct of the... It's that we will choose him. So that we know him. That we know it's through him. That we know he builds it all. And I have to say that because it's so surprising how many times Christians and churches still keep treating the Lord like he is the honorary king and not the king. Like he's some chancellor of a university who only turns up to shake people's hands when the certificates go out. And that we're the vice chancellors who really do all the work. And that's nonsense. It is God who is establishing his kingdom. He has to be. He isn't just kind of meddling here, there, everywhere. He is the one who is doing it. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by my spirit, says the Lord. It will be an act of unmerited favor that you will punch through and get past that mountain. See, we often confuse salvation as grace. And we may miss this. You see, salvation is, of course, an act of grace. But salvation is not the only act of grace that God does. Because grace is pouring out unmerited favor. We don't deserve any of it. Therefore, if the accomplishment of the work of God is absolutely certain, even though there is a blockage created by the Lord in order to reveal the motives of men, then what is left for us to do is not fear the blockage, not doubt the work, but rather not to despise the day of small beginnings. And that's the point. See, who's here building this temple? Only 10%. The other night he can't be bothered. How are you going to do it? You're not even a nation anymore. You're not even half a nation. You're not even a city anymore. What are you? You're just a ragtag bunch of people who couldn't make it in one place. So you've moved somewhere else because you thought you'd try your luck. 
How can you in the cave of Adullam, your worthless men, debtors, people who've been chased out of your own homes, chased away your rakes and you're no good, how can you become mighty men of God? But don't doubt small beginnings. The kingdom of heaven began with Abraham. The parting of the Red Sea began with a baby in a boat. The behemoth, gigantic organization that is the church, how can you even direct it? Began with two guys on a picnic blanket. How much does it have to be to build a temple? How strong do the people have to be? How large does the army have to be? How much money does there have to be in the bank account before we can plant churches? We can send missionaries. How much does it have to get to the end? You know, striving won't help. It doesn't matter how hard you work. Effort isn't the problem. That's not what's pushing you through. The scripture here teaches you entirely, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit. It's an entire work of God. It's an act of grace. And just as the blockage reveals who the chaff is, it also reveals who the wheat is. And the chaff is that that rejects God. It's not those that couldn't push through. It's not those that struggle. It's those who reject God. And the wheat are those who wait upon the Lord. For he will renew their strength like eagle's wings. But what we know from Ephesians 2.10, which is like a central point of this church, is that the linchpin of our purpose and our direction as a church is that we want all people to be active in the kingdom of heaven. Mike and I were talking about this when we were on holiday. We talked about our, our belief here as a church, that statement that we want people to find that good work to do it and to do it better. And he was asking me the question about whether people, all people have that calling. And we looked around the swimming pool and I said, look at all the people here in this swimming pool. I said, every single one of them, God had them on his mind when he created the heavens and the earth and he created them for good works. I said, but there may only be me and you in this swimming pool who have any idea that that's what God wants. How many in this world will never find that good work that they were created for, but I believe that God created all of us to find that place in the kingdom. So if that's true, and we're supposed to be an active part of the kingdom in heaven, finding that good work and do it better, isn't that a bit of a contradiction after saying it's not by any effort, it's not by anything, and it's by not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We're back to, well, you do it then, Lord. We're going for a coffee. The Lord will do it, and we cannot. But what we need to be is an active part of what the Lord is doing. By coming to understand the most important point in your point, you weren't saved because of your abilities. Many Christians have got this idea that God's collecting, I've got a youth pastor, and I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to get, this guy's good at music, so we're, we're accepting this into the kingdom, and, oh, this guy does drama, so we can, we can create this whole kind of quiver of really good bow arrows that we can shoot and go here and everywhere. God didn't call you because of what you can do. God called you and saved you because he loves you. God didn't give you your calling because you're really good at acting or you're really good at, at music or you're really good at, at preaching or you're really good at this. He gave you your calling because he loves you. It's important that you know that. You were called by God because he loved you. 
You're not used by the Lord because of your skills. You're used because God loves you. Remember that. When you say, but I can't. But he loves you. And he wouldn't cause you to do anything that you can't do. He wouldn't bring you to somewhere that he isn't going to equip you for. Because it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so if we understand it's by the spirit of Lord, and it's the spirit in the body, and it's the spirit in the church that does that work. In Zechariah, we start to get it because he sees a lampstand with seven branches. And we read Revelations chapter 1 to 3. We're not going to read that, don't turn to it. If you read Revelations chapter 1 to 3, the seven letters to the churches, all of the churches are a lampstand. They're all a seven-branched lampstand, a menorah as we call them. So we're seeing the church. We're seeing a church. And that's what's there. Besides the lamp is two olive trees. Either side... In verse 12, we see that they're pouring the oil that's in themselves into the lampstand. And that's because at this time, lamps were powered by oil. Olive oil. So just remember that. If you ever put an olive oil in your hair, don't get too near to a flame. <laughs> <laughs> You will not like the results. <laughs> Highly flammable. That's the point. Now, if the lamp stand is the church and the image is that two olive trees are continually pouring into the church, without it the light of the lamp would not burn bright, we might ask what could the image therefore mean? What could the olive tree mean? Well, the answer is given to us really clearly. In fact, what you could see in this whole chapter is, is that the angel's quite surprised that Zechariah doesn't know the answers to these questions. Like, seriously? You don't know? So let's turn to Revelation 11 and let's read verses 1 to 14. And we will see exactly who these two olive branches are. Oh, sorry, olive trees are. Revelation 11, verses 1 to 14. Then I was given a re reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and prophesy one thousand two hundred sixty days. Clothed in sackcloth, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of earth, of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouths and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut, uh, have to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the day of their prophecy and they have power over water to turn them into blood and strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beasts that ascend out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their deed, bodies, their dead bodies, uh, three and a half days, and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on all on those who saw them. Thank you very much. Now there's a lot, again, complex in that that we aren't going to look at, 
but the very clear understanding as it's written in that verse, what are the two olive trees? They're the two witnesses of the tribulation period. These two guys that come and they have a certain amount of power. And we'll look at what they are. First of all, the word for witness here in the Greek is martus. And it means martyr. They are two martyrs. In other words, they're ones who are prepared to give themselves for the message and witness of the Lord. And Revelation describes their attributes. They are not given power, as some scriptures read it in there, that they were given power. The word power, if you've got a King James or a New King James, you will see is in italics. It's an added word. It's not the power that they're given. It's that the witnesses are given. They are given to the church because they're the two olive trees pouring the oil in. They are given, and it's the witnesses that the Lord has given. Just turn with me to John 15, and let's read verses 26 to 27. But I will send you an advocate, the Holy the Spirit of Truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of the of my ministry. It's the testimony. But they do have spiritual powers. To call down, we read that in Jeremiah five, where he calls down his words themselves are the fire. It reveals power that they will have in their words. It's amazing how you can argue with somebody for scripture. There are certain people who want to argue with me about everything that they think is wrong. And their first phrase that comes out of my mouth is, now don't talk to me about scripture because you can run rings around me with scripture. Well, the minute somebody tells you to sheaf up your sword, it's not a fair fight anymore. Because there's power in the word of God. It changes life. It separates marrow. They could turn water into blood. We see that in Moses. What's the purpose of the ten plagues? It does, but to who? To the Israelites. Because they've been slaves for 400 years and they need to learn that those stone statues are not as powerful as the Lord God Almighty. And so he, in each one of those plagues, attacks each one of the ten gods of Egypt and comes down on them and destroys them very powerfully. Elijah held back the rain to bring people to reject their double-mindedness and follow the Lord. And these witnesses are given the authority to do the very same things that Moses and Elijah did. These witnesses are the olive tree. They pour oil into the lamps, which are the church. Now, the two characters who actually poured out their spirits in the Old Testament, we have Moses, who did it when he cried to the Lord, you know what, either kill me or help me, because these people are driving me mad, but I can't leave them alone. So he said, well, find me 70 people, 70 elders, the same heart of you, and I will put your spirit on them, meaning I'll put the spirit on them from you. The same heart, the same mind, same attitude. Elijah did the same with Elisha. Poured upon him a double portion of what came before. It was not Elijah and Moses that went into the 70 into Elisha, it was the Holy Spirit. And we know that because when the spirit came down, two sneaky little crafty monkeys didn't leave the camp like they were all supposed to and started to prophesy. And Joshua said, stop him. Stop him, Moses. That's your job. And Moses said, I wish that the whole nation were prophets. He looked towards the time of the church when we were all called, as Ephesians 4, 11 teaches us, to be prophets to one another. And that's what we have to remember. And that's what we have to challenge and what we have to pour within ourselves. But just because they're like Moses and they're like Elijah, they aren't Moses and Elijah, like some people think they are. Just like John the Baptist isn't Elijah, like some people thought he was. 
He just came in the same power. And when we get to Malachi, we will look at the prophecies concerning John the Baptist. And it, it looks like it says Elijah is coming, but it doesn't mean Elijah is coming in the same way that it isn't Zerubbabel that we'll put on the capstone, but in the spirit of Zerubbabel, in the spirit of Elijah, in the spirit of Moses. What are they here for? Well, they're here for the church to embolden and encourage them through their own testimony. Why do they need to do that? Well, what's the time period of Revelation 11? It's the great tribulation. Oh, you are out of practice now, aren't you? The great tribulation. That seven-year period where the saints have been lifted from the earth, where the Israel has found the Lord again, where the 144,000 are preaching, where people are getting saved, and the only way of salvation is martyrdom. It will come to everybody. They'll be forced to take the mark of the beast. And it will be disaster upon disaster upon disaster. And the time that scripture says is like no other that existed. Lord, why is this mountain in the way? Why seven years and not seven minutes? Seven minutes of this is enough. Why seven years? Despite sometimes misguided opinion. The Holocaust didn't actually start until 1942. That was when the first Jewish people were put into gas chambers. In three years, six million people were killed. It lets you know that when an industrial process is put in place with planning and organization for bureaucratic Governments and even organizations like IBM who got involved with the technical and computer processing that came in that. What can be done in a short space of time? Three years is nothing. Three years is a degree at university. Three years. You say that it doesn't feel like nothing when you're doing it. But <laughs> it's no time. Seven years, Lord, why is that mountain in the way? Please move it. This isn't funny. This isn't easy. This is hard. But the olive trees are here. And they're pouring oil into the church. And they are pouring encouragement in by their testimony. By what's going through. The time of the last kingdom. Causing the last blockage. Which will end with the return of Jesus. But through that period we talk about this terrible intense persecution like Nothing which has ever happened before. Imagine that. And this is the reason why they're sent to be martyrs. They're pouring out. They're working in power. But they're not pouring out to stop the works of the enemy. But to pour themselves into the church to keep the church going through its trial and its tribulation. So it doesn't falter, it doesn't fail. Though, even though it's another time when man can't work, just like here in Zechariah, where it's a time where no man can work because the kingdom, the mountain, has stopped. But when John's in heaven, even though nobody's allowed to work, he sees so many people getting saved, he can't count it. People talk about the Great Tribulation period as being a time that will be destitute of all hope. People will find hope. They'll find it in Jesus. And in a time when the devil thinks he has utter control, more people will get saved in a time when he did not. They're there to keep them through. Why? Because it isn't by their might and it isn't by their power that they are going to sustain themselves. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. It's by my spirit. 
And that is the final fulfillment of this message of Zechariah. That in the final days, in the hardest time for Israel, in the time of Jacob's trouble, in a time like no other, when death is as common as paving stones. The church will be strengthened. The Lord will send some olive trees and he'll strengthen. You understand that when you're standing in front of it, you're mountain that will not move. God stands somebody by the left and the right of you to pour into you, to keep pouring into you, and to keep pouring into you. And when you don't have that, then you feel it. That's the final fulfillment. A church which is weak, constantly emboldened by the Spirit through testimony in order to keep it. But here in Zechariah, we don't see the end. We see the beginning. In their time frame, this is the beginning of it. And the two olive trees pouring into that lampstand are not Elijah and Moses. The Zechariah and Haggai. The two who have been sent by God to encourage the people who had stopped. Not because of themselves, but because the mountain had caused the blockage. But when they went with that message to cause the rebuilding to begin and give the promises of Zerubbabel, finishing the work and laying this top stone, what they pour in is not of themselves. It's oil. Without oil in our lamps, we cannot burn. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. We can strive and strive, we can work, and we can do all that we can try to do to try and keep that lamp burning, but without the Spirit, doesn't matter how hard you try and to the best of your skills, we cannot battle against spiritual powers. You are not the Ghostbusters. You can't fight against spiritual powers. Only God can fight against them. Because it's not by your might and it's not by your power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. It's the spirit that rages that war. And we, therefore, need to be filled with the spirit to wage that war. Jesus declared to those who receive me, Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, which John tells us in John 7, 37 to 40, is the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel pre-prophesies that moment and says there will come a time when the marshes and the dry ground and the dead area, talking about places like the Dead Sea, which you can see on pictures of being an utterly dead and barren area, that there will be a time when water will pour out and gush forth and it will bring life into those areas. And fishermen will be able to fish and draw out. There aren't fishermen in the Old Testament. There are shepherds. And there are vineyard dressers. And there are soldiers. And there are watchmen. But you don't get fishermen until you get to the New Testament. But Ezekiel saw a time when there'll be fishermen that take their own rivers with them. And wherever they go, they bring life into that area because it's not them that bring life to that area. It is the Spirit that brings life to that area. It is the Spirit. It's why the message that you can preach can be preached in one place and five people are asleep and nobody heard what you said. The same message can be preached in another place. And there is life in that place. And they are jumping and it is changing because it's not by might. It's not by power, it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And yet, even though we are called to be a part of that, and we are called because the Lord loves us to be a part of that, because it's his choice to be a part of that, it's by his spirit that it is done. 
The infilling of the Holy Spirit was the seal of the church aid. The lamp needs oil. So what does this passage teach us? Well, in verse 1, Zechariah has to be woken up. But it's not a new dream. It's not a new prophecy. It's still the same prophecy. So what's that all about? Well, here's the first lesson to you. It's time to wake up from your deep sleep. The beginning of every move of God in this country, and therefore in other countries, I believe, has always begun with an awakening experience. A group of people who have seen something in Scripture that they hadn't previously seen, and then look around the room and go, but I don't see it now. The early Pentecostal church, of course, we can resonate with that and understand that these were men that saw the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit and said, Lord, why not now? Where is this now? And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And half the church freaked and threw them out. And the other half joined them. But they had to wake up. Well, they'd been going to church, they'd been preaching. They weren't bad people, they weren't godless people, they weren't even unsaved people. But they saw something that they hadn't seen before, and now they were woken up. Wake up. Here is revelation. And that's why we see this. That in verse 11, Zechariah asks what the olive trees are doing and who they are, and the angel doesn't give him a response. So he asks again in verse 12. And the angel, surprised, he's asking. How, are you, how do you not know that there is a gift of the Holy Spirit? Do you, have you ripped the book of Acts out of your Bible? Where do you think that went? Well, we haven't done that for a while. Well, it's there. I've told you, you and Isaiah, that a people with stammering lips, who are not my people, will call me. Told you that it is the absolute proof in Acts chapter 10 that this is how Gentiles can get saved because they spoke in tongues and the Holy Spirit can only go into that that has been made clean by God. So they must have accepted Jesus as Savior and they managed to do it without following the law, going through any sin offerings or getting circumcised. So God's poured his spirit out and it's awaking. John Wesley out on his horse preaching the gospel and people are going, what are you doing? Well, I'm telling people about Jesus. What? Why does the Bible tell us we're supposed to be doing that? All over it! Wake up. Wake up. Here's the revelation. It's been forgotten. But it was always a spiritual truth. It was always a spiritual truth. And sometimes that mountain that's in front of you just need to know that the Spirit is with you. And just like the beginning of any move of God, Zechariah has to follow the true path of prayer. He has to be persistent. And we read, we won't for time, but we read in Luke 11, verses 5 to 10, Jesus' parable about persistent prayer. Prayer is like somebody who's had some guests arrive at midday, or midnight and goes to his friend, throw me down three loaves. No, we're in bed. No, go on, I haven't got anything. I haven't got them and they have arrived. And I need to give them something. And only you can provide the need. And Jesus says, I tell you, it's not because he kept banging on the door that it, the prayer was answered, but because he was so cheeky with it. Because he was impudent. That's the word. It's my favorite word. Impudent prayers. Cheeky prayers. Lord, why not? If you pray for what you already have the ability to provide, the Lord will not answer you. He has already answered you. Prayer is reserved for the things that we cannot do. That only he can do. It's not the cheekiness of the prayer that means the prayer will be answered. But it's the persistent cheekiness of the prayer. When prayed in the will of God, that we'll see God answer that prayer. And he does. 
So what does all this say together? Let's cap it all together and finish now with a paragraph or two. Willing vessels who want to be used and realize it's not them that's the problem. It's not them that can solve, but the spirit. And when they do, they will cry, I must decrease and you must increase. And we must become olive trees ourselves. Olive trees to our church. Pouring the works of the Spirit through us into it so that the light of the church may burn bright. Therefore, don't let your circumstances dictate your closeness to the Father. Don't let the blockages be a cause of despondence, but be a willing vessel and a channel of his spirit, knowing the end is certain, the Lord will do it. Listen. It's not you. It's never been you. It's been a work of God through you. Amen. The Lord bless you all. Next week, the flying scroll and the woman in a basket.